Good afternoon, everyone. On this blistering hot August afternoon. Uh, good to see you all. Please open your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2. 2 Peter, chapter 2. It's there in your bulletin. Uh, also, it will be up on the screen. However, uh, if you notice, uh, <clears throat> it says 1 through 21. However, we're only going to read uh, verses 1 to 3. And then we're going to skip verses 10 through 12. And then we'll pick it up again from verse 13 to 21. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, no, 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 no. Sorry, in your bulletin, uh, this is chapter one. And uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so you're going to need the screen or your own uh, Bible app. Yeah. Sorry, Fernando. I, maybe I didn't put it clearly in the, in the group text. But it's chapter two, verses one to three. No? Chapter one. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, ta, 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 ta. All right. No screen. <laughs> no bulletin. Yeah. However, I still think the bulletin is great. Uh, because if you look on the inside of the bulletin, ah, there's a great song, Forgiven. And then there's a great prayer. Prayer before reading and reflecting on Scripture. I think I'm going to use this this week. Very great prayer. So I, I'll commend that to you. The bulletin is still redeemable. <laughs> However, uh, you have your pew Bible, you have your, your, your app, you have your devices. Uh, please turn in your Bible to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 to 3 and then skip verses 4 through 12. And we'll pick it up at verse 13 through 22. Pastor Chris, why are you skipping verses 4 through 12? Is it too difficult for you to teach? Do you not understand? Uh, yes, it is. No, no. It's, it's difficult, but... Uh, The portion we're, we're not going to read is uh, not the meat of the text. Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, chapter 2 is the main chapter of the book of 2 Peter. And we want to preach, teach the, the main and plain things in this chapter. We want the meat, if you will. Chapter, or excuse me, verses 4 through 12 are the kind of, kind of bone. Bones are important. But uh, for the purposes of time and uh, exposition, we want the meat. And if you are curious about the meaning or applications of verses 4 through 12, I'll be happy to talk with you afterwards. If you have any questions, oh, because it's strange. And I will refer to verses 4 through 12, especially verse 10. But uh, we're not going to read it today, and I'm not going to explain it, uh, because there's so much to explain around it, OK? So that's the first bit I need to tell you before we read. The second part I need to tell you is uh, something I don't want to say, but uh, it's necessary as uh, one of the pastors here. Uh, three weeks ago, I was preaching on the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And I used an illustration from a philosopher. And I said that the best philosophers throughout the ages have said, 
reasonably and logically, you are not able to prove the existence of God. But not only that, you are also not able to reasonably and logically disprove the existence of God. That is, you cannot use logic and reason to prove that God does not exist. So either way, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, it's an act of faith. And uh, I noticed some of your faces was like, hmm? And I thought, uh-oh, let me double check that. I, as you know, I don't speak with notes. Uh, they sometimes just get in the way. So I get messed up a bit. And uh, I take what I say in the pulpit very seriously. And I have to correct myself. Um, it's maybe the first time I've had to do this. So bear with me. I went back to the text or what I was studying. And the illustration was from a, a man named Blaise Pascal. He was a philosopher from France in the uh, last century. And probably one of our best philosophers in the Christian faith. And I was trying to use his point. But his point was not that you, you can't have logic to prove uh, the existence of God. His point was this. I'll make this very clear. There are many people who say there is no evidence. You cannot prove God by what we see, hear, feel, taste, and experience through science. Therefore, you need something other than reason or evidence to prove God. And Blaise Pascal's answer was, no, 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 no. There is plenty of evidence for God. And you can look at all the evidence there is, but still it's a bit of a jump, logically, to conclude that God exists from this evidence. So the evidence is there, and you can use reason to conclude God, yes, there is a God. But on the other side, you can also conclude, no, I look at the evidence and there is no God. So, either way, it takes faith. So forgive me. I didn't mean to say that believing in God is not a use of logic or reason. Now, why do I go through the trouble of saying that before we read the text? Oh, fixed it? Sasuga. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. We have the tools. Good. So, before we go into the text, I need to say this because this pulpit, the place of preaching in the church, is not something we use lightly. Oh, it's just talk. It's just a speech. It's just a performance. No, it is not. We believe this is a matter of heaven and hell. Eternal life and eternal death. What is said here needs to be upheld and defended and taken very seriously. And that, that brings us to what we're saying today. <clears throat> today is not a subject that will have a lot of yes and amens. Uh, many of you are familiar in the United States. Last week there was a big event in a place called Charlottesville. There were many white supremacists and Nazis uh, protesting and then there was an anti-protest, and then one girl was killed, many were injured. And so uh, many of the media was very easy. Racism is bad. White supremacy is evil. Yay! And then there were lots of pastors 
Racism is from hell. White supremacy is against the gospel. Yay! It's very easy. Of course, racism is wrong. That's very easy to, to applaud. And yes and amen. But there is a greater evil, or at least as evil, and it's not going to get a lot of yes and applause. And that is the subject that we have here today, which is false teachers and sexual freedom. Specifically, homosexuality, gay marriage, same-sex living. They call it a lifestyle. We in the church call it sin. Transsexuality, transgenderism, gender fluidity, all of these terms and words that we need to be able to say with a clear voice and good reasoning and a scriptural foundation. And you say, ah, Pastor Chris, this is, this is Japan. There's no problems with that here. Are you sure about that? Have you been reading the newspapers? Are you checking the headlines? It's almost over overseas. And it's coming here to Japan. It's already here. And it's already in the church. And the pastor and the leadership needs to be very clear. There will be no, oh, yeah, hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord. There's going to be a lot of, huh? Hontoka. But what we say here, what we preach and teach and proclaim is of life and death heaven and hell. One more point <laughs> before we get into the text. Last one, I promise. We welcome lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, transgender, adulterers, pornographers, sexual idolaters, whatever. We welcome we receive, we accept. But acceptance is different from affirmation. We will accept anyone who comes, but we will not affirm any sin. That's a big difference, and I'll get into it uh, as we apply the text. But please do not mistake what I'm saying for hate speech some kind of racism or some kind of genderism or some kind of bigotry. Listen, we all know, you and I both know, none of us here is without sin. None of us here is completely perfect in terms of sexuality and even purity. But we still come to hear the word of God and to hear the truth. And so that's the point today. So let's go. We're going to read together. I'll start from verse 1 through 3. I'll continue to verse 13 through 16. And please join me at the end, verses 17 through 22. And uh, we'll do our best <clears throat> to preach this right. Hear now the word of God. But there, was also, uh, there were also false prophets among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, Teachers, uh, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Skip down to verse 13. They will be paid back with harm for uh, the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure 
is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed, an accursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Let's read together. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog revert, returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. This is the word of God. Amen. <clears throat> Pastor Chris, what in the world are you doing today? What is this obscure, strange little corner of the Bible that you're going to try to preach the gospel from? Is the gospel there? Oh, yes. The gospel is there. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'll get there. But oh no, this is not a little corner of your Bible that we try to hide away in church. In fact, this subject is so important. This idea of false teachers, sexual freedom, is so important. It's not just in Peter chapter 2. There's a book just before you reach Revelation, the book of Jude written by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, it's almost the exact same thing. When you read the book of 1 Corinthians, especially verses, chapters 5 and 6, chapters 12, same subject. False teachers, sexual freedom. The book of Galatians, false teachers, sexual freedom. When Paul was leaving the church in Ephesus, and was doing his final sayonara, he was talking about false teachers. Jesus himself, on the Sermon on the Mount, at the conclusion of his sermon, the greatest sermon ever preached, talked about false teachers. And it's not just from Jesus. You go back to the book of Ezra, false prophets. The book of Jeremiah, he had a false prophet he was battling, a prophet named Zedekiah. You go back even further. How far back? To the beginning. The book of, of uh, Numbers. The first five books of the, of the Bible, taken as a unit, it's in there. We even read about him. Balaam, son of Beor, or Bezer. False prophets are from the beginning the middle and the end of your Bible. And not only are false prophets in there, it's not some corner, it's not some little pocket of scripture, it's all through there, but there's something about the false prophets that you can understand and see. 
And there's two things. The first is money, greed, possessions. And the second is sex, sex. Now, uh, is that what you get from this scripture, Pastor Chris? You have to be very clear. So before we talk about homosexuality, gay marriage, and all of that, okay, we need to lay a foundation. We need to build a case. Okay? So we're going to start with a text, and we're going to see where it goes from there. Okay? So let's read together, or you can just follow with me. Um, verse 1, there were false prophets among the people. The people. That's God's people, Israel. There were false prophets, that's past tense. That's the Old Testament, the false prophets. And now let's go to the present and the future. Just as there will be false teachers among you. The church. Peter is writing to these churches, these Christians, these new believers that he has been pastoring. He has been raising up. Now he's in Rome under the Emperor Nero. Nero is about to crucify him and sew him, uh, excuse me, saw him in half. And he knows he's going to die. So he's got to leave a lasting message for his beloved people. And what does he tell you? Be careful. Be very careful. There's going to be false teachers, not from the outside, among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Heresy? That's an old word, Pastor Chris. Heresy? That's religion. That's doctrine. That's dogma. That's in the scripture. Heresy is what you believe about reality. What you believe about all of reality will affect how you live your life. If there is a God, life will be a whole lot different if there is no God. And so heresy is believing the wrong thing about all of reality. And so these secret teachers, these false teachers are going to come in and they're going to subtly, secretly, kind of just under the... They're not going to say, hi, hi, I'm here to preach heresy. I'm here to preach the wrong thing and teach, no. It's going to be secret and subtle. And it's going to be something like this. We get lots of people that come through the doors, new, new people, all the time, all the time. Been here 18 years, seen hundreds of people come through. And the ones you notice are the ones who come in, ah, yes, uh, you know, I was, a, I was a worship leader in my home church, uh, I even taught a Bible study. I was in the children's ministry. And, you know, they, they got something about them. They can, they're well-spoken. They have knowledge of the Bible. They have experience in ministry. And they're absolutely sincere. But then there are some who are coming from a teaching or coming from a, 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 a church or a pastor or a discipleship that has nothing to do with the gospel. One example, that's very simple. Um, uh, one of us here, I won't say who, was posting something on Facebook. And they posted a, uh, uh, a video, a very wonderful video about um, Christianity and how faith in God helps this person to uh, uh, overcome hardship and difficulty you know, testing and trial, and, and you become stronger uh, and, and a more uh, good person through faith and through reading the Bible. There's wisdom in the scriptures and there's uh, help in the church. A great video. But I was waiting for the video to get somewhere that all good messages have to get through. And the video went on and on about having faith and trusting God and finding Jesus. And then it was over. And I thought, well, that's weird. What's wrong with this video? So I followed, I saw the, 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 the company that made it. 
and I checked the website and I found the church that sponsors the website and I went to the church, I didn't go to the church, I went to the, the church webpage and I looked at their statement of faith. Every good church, every proper church has a statement of belief. This is what we believe. And you can click on to that, and I looked, nothing. Oh, there's a lot about uh, church, a lot about health, and there's a lot about um, the Spirit of God, and there's a lot about um, the Bible is our guide, but there's nothing about the Bible is the, the number one authority inspired by God. There's nothing about um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, equal, co-equal, co-eternal, one in substance. There's nothing about sin, hell, repentance, regeneration, conversion, nothing about that. Oh, oh, but there's a lot about leadership and training, discipleship, a lot about community, but there's no sin, there's no confession, there's no cross. I don't know what's going on. So I look at the pastor. You know, every good church has a website with the beliefs and what, who's the pastor and where did they go to school and what, what training did they have. And finally I said, it's not a good website. It's not a good church. False teacher. So I had to email one of our sisters. I said, this is a great video and I understand that you were touched by it and you were moved by it and it helped you and encouraged you but I need to, I, I love you, I baptized you. So I warn you, as your father in, the, in Christ, be careful, because they're not preaching the gospel. It's subtle, it's secret. Oh yeah, having faith, oh it helps me grow, I become a strong, where's the gospel? Where's salvation in Jesus Christ through the blood of the cross, where is that, okay? It's, it's not there, but it has something that you want. Everybody wants happiness, a good life, success, progress, growth, strength, perseverance. That's good. But there is no crown without a cross. Amen? It's subtle. Now, I'm preaching already, but I need to keep teaching, okay? They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, denying the Sovereign Lord. Now, if you have your paper Bible, if you're taking notes, Sovereign Lord. That needs to be marked, written, circled, underlined, starred, highlighted. Okay? They deny the Sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Okay, so I need to stop there. That's a, a key word. I'm going to give you two key words today. That's the first one. The Sovereign Lord who bought them. Okay, well, not a key word, a key phrase. So the sovereign Lord, the word there is despotes in Greek. It's uh, the word we get despot or, 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 or uh, dictator or the other word is master, okay? The master. They deny the master who bought them, who bought them. They're denying that Jesus is the master of their life. And they're denying that Jesus bought them. Now, this word bought... Where did we find this word in the New Testament? It's used in a place called 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You don't have to turn there, just trust me. Well, if you don't trust me, you can turn there. But follow with me, okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is saying, you have a body, but it's not your body anymore. You have been bought with a price, and your body is no longer your own. Are you familiar with this? Yes? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He's talking about a young man in the church who is sleeping with his stepmother. And he's saying, young man, you have a master who bought you with a price. The price was the blood. You have no freedom now. It's not about your, the way you want to use your body and have sex with whoever you want. So the word bought has a link with sexual activity. Are, we fo are you following me so far? 
There's another place. We're in 2 Peter, but if you go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, somewhere around verse 14, I think, it says, Peter, Peter again says, you were bought so that you don't follow the way of your forefathers and continue in lustful desires. You were bought. And so even in Peter, he's saying, bought with a price has something to do with the way you use your body. Are you following so far? That's a very important word there, bought. So here's the idea. Peter and Paul, these apostles, they have an image of us Christians. A long time ago, we were slaves to sin and death. But through Jesus' blood being given as a price, he paid it. Jesus paid it all through his blood. And now we have been bought out of slavery. And now we have a new master. Therefore, if I use my body to, to, to please or to, to give or serve the old master of sin, sexual sin, let's be clear, then I'm saying, Jesus is not my master. He's not my Lord. He didn't buy me. Right? That's the message here. But let's be even more clear. We have to keep laying the, the, the foundation. Verse 2. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. There, that word. Circle that one. Depraved conduct. That's one word in uh, the Greek. Another word translation is licentiousness, sexual immorality, all of that. Okay, fornication. So, it's just a big fancy word for proud sex. Okay, deprived conduct. Sexual immorality. What kind of sexual immorality? Well, you can read about it. It keeps going. If you, you don't, I don't know if we have it there, verse 10. And verse 10. This is especially true of those who follow corrupt desire of the flesh. Same word in verse 2. And despise authority. So this, this sexuality, this sexual freedom is what they say, is bonded together, is connected to this arrogance, this pride that says, I'm the master. I'm in control. Authority? Who are you to tell me what I should do with my body? I don't want no authority. That's the kind of sexuality we're talking about. But it keeps going. If you keep going down, uh, verse, uh, verse 10. Keep going, verse 10. Back to verse 10, but the next sentence. Bold and arrogant right? They're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Um, and then go uh, even further down in verse 18, okay? Oh, excuse me, verse 14. Eyes full of adultery. They never stop sinning, okay? And then um, uh, verse 18. Uh, with, uh, they mouth empty, boastful words, appealing to the what? Lustful desire, same word, corrupt depravity, depraved conduct, lustful, sinful desires, sexual, open, free, proud, arrogant, boastful sexuality that says, I'm the master of my body. These are the false teachers. So there's a connect, it's very clear, is it not? It's very clear. False teachers, false teachers in the church, false teachers in and amongst us, secretly, subtly, introducing a kind of freedom. I need to do one more thing before we get into the application. We talked about Balaam, or it, it talked about Balaam. Uh, where was that? Verse, uh, 
uh, yes, verse 15. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer. Uh, so, some of you knew as Christians, I love it. Some of you still not familiar with the stories. Okay, and that's, that's okay. That's why we're here. We're to teach and preach. So, let's get some, some uh, adding to our knowledge. Okay, so uh, go back to the book of Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, okay, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fourth book. In chapters 21, 22, 23, there's a story of the people of Israel. And they're going into the new promised land of Canaan, about two million. And they're doing good. They're conquering. They're marching. They're defeating enemies. And so now they come to the city just on the border of the new land, Canaan. It's called Moab. And Mo the people of Moab, there's five kings, five cities, and they're all freaking out. They're like, these Israelites are going to come and we're finished. So Moab, the, the people of Moab said, okay, here's what we'll do. God, their God, Yahweh, is helping them. Let's find a prophet of Yahweh who speaks Yahweh's words and let's try to use that prophet to put a curse on the people of Israel. And that prophet's name was Balaam. That's what we read here. And so Balaam was a kind of voodoo, kind of shaman, kind of you know, man of power, right? He could speak, he could heal, he could touch. And when he blessed people, they were blessed. And when, they were, and when he cursed people, they were cursed. And so the king of Moab says, Balak was the name, king of Moab says, ba Balaam, I need you to curse these people. So what does Balaam do? I'm not going to do it for free. You want my services? It's not free, my friend. Because I only speak the words of Yahweh. I speak the words of God. Hint, i.e., translation, you need to pay me, right? False prophet. Any prophet that wants to do this job for money, any pastor, any preacher, any teacher, any evangelist that's here for the money, false prophet. So, so he comes in and he goes, to bl he goes to curse them and God fills them with his word, but the word is not curse, it's blessing. So he's like, God, cur, God, cur, Yahweh, bless them. Give them victory. What's going on here? And Balak is going, hey, I paid you. I don't know. I can't say it. I'll do it again if I have to. So Balak says, okay, how much? Three times. Balaam says, and he can't do it. He only gives blessing. So last time, he tries again and again. Last time, Balak says, I'll give you one more chance. So, he gets, so Balaam gets on his donkey, his old donkey, and he goes to pronounce the curse on them. And what happens was God sends an angel, and the angel stands in the road in front of the donkey. Nobody else sees it except the, the donkey. And so the donkey gets off the road and onto a small road into the wine. Uh, wine, well, vineyard. And on the vineyard, there's on one side, there's a big wall, and on the other side, there's another wall. And so the angel of the Lord goes and stands in front of the, the donkey on this new little path. And so the donkey is like, uh, uh, and the donkey moves over, and Balaam's foot is crushed between the donkey and the wall. And he's like, What are you doing? What are you doing? He starts hitting the donkey. And finally, the donkey, just, the donkey just sits down, gives up, right? There's a big fiery angel with a sword in front of her, and she just sits down, and Balaam just takes it, just bam, bam, starts whipping. And the, the donkey is going, huh? And finally, the Lord opens the mouth of the donkey and says, what are you doing? Can't you see? Why would I be doing this? If I'm not trying to help you, if I go any further, you're dead. 
And so the donkey is rebuking the master. Okay, we, we follow, right? <clears throat> That's one thing we find out about Balaam. He's in it for the money. But not only is he in it for the money, here's another thing that Balaam does. Balaam realizes, I can't put a curse on Israel, so I'm going to try to trick them. So what does he do? He says, okay, kings, get all your females. Get all your prostitutes. Let them put on all their nicest clothes, the ones with the V-neck, the ones with the slit up the side, with the high heels, and let them go and see what happens. And so Balaam finds a, makes a plot with Moab to try and seduce the people of Israel into sexual sin with Moab. And it worked. It worked. These false prophets and these false teachers, if they can't get you one way through your money, they're going to get you another way through your pants. That's what Peter is trying to say. I love you, church. I love you, church. Why do I love you? Because when Jesus rose from the dead and he had breakfast with me on that beach that one morning, he asked me, Peter, do you love me? And I answered, yeah, I love you, Lord. And he said to me, if you love me, feed my sheep. And he asked me three times. I almost cried. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Do you agape me, Peter? Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Give them food that will feed their souls, that will give them strength to live, that will bring them from the gates of hell to the gates of heaven. Feed them. That's why we're all here. Amen? We're here to be fed. But sometimes we need to be protected. So Peter is loving his people and he's saying, there are those mm, out there that are not trying to feed you. They're trying to eat you. They're, wool, they're wolves in the, sh in the clothing of sheep. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, And they're already here. Jesus has been gone for 30 years, not even 30 years. And they're already there. And they've been here all through these thousands of years. And they're here now. So I looked up um, on Google churches, denominations that affirm same-sex marriage that affirm uh, LGBT uh, oh my goodness and I thought okay I, I had heard there was a list uh, of a few of a few things um, what in the world um, I had heard that in America, the United Methodist Church, uh, not only do they have the female uh, pastors and bishops, um, one of them was a lesbian in Denver, and it turned out that the United Methodists are now, across the board, affirming uh, LGBT uh, rights, or excuse me, um, uh, pastors, they, they have pastors who uh, who are gay, an openly gay lesbian pastor of a church. That was a few months ago. And then I read the headline uh, in England, the Anglican Church is now allowing LGBT uh, same-sex marriages and pastors. So I thought, how many are there now? So I looked it up, and um, it was on. I just found this thing on Wikipedia. On Wikipedia, there's a list 
of Christian denominations that affirm LGBT. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe it's like, you know, five or ten, maybe twenty or so, maybe twenty. It was almost a hundred. You can look you can Google it right now. I had it, I had it ready, but then I had deleted it. So let's start with Asia. Anglican Church of Korea. Church of South India. United Church of Christ in Japan. United Church of Christ in the Philippines. Africa. Anglican Church of Southern Africa. Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa. Methodist Church of Southern Africa. Uniting Presbyterian Church in Southern Africa. My favorite pastor, preacher, Bible teacher is Presbyterian. <clears throat> so in America, the Presbyterian Church, USA, open. Old Catholic Church, this is now in North America. There's, oh, there's like a ton in North America. Alliance of Baptists, American Baptist Churches, USA. I'm American Baptist. Association of Welcoming and Affirming Baptists, Catholic Apostolic Church of North America, Christian Church, Community of Christ, Ecclesia Gnostica, Episcopal Church, United States, Evangelical Catholic Church, Metropolitan Community Church, Reformed Anglican, Anglican Catholic Church, Europe, uh, well, there's Austria, Belgium, Croatia, Denmark, Iceland, uh, Norway, Portugal, Romania, Sweden, Switzerland, British Quakers, Wales, Affirming Pentecostal Church International, Albania, in Italy, Poland, United Kingdom, Church of England, Church in Wales, Church of Ireland, Church of Scotland, Methodist Church of Great Britain, Scottish Episcopal Church, the list goes on and on. Affirming, welcoming, allowing openly homosexual, gay, lesbian sin. Not in the pews, here in the pulpit. Okay, Pastor Chris, where are you going now? Let's go to the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, 21. Okay. What, what are the sins? Very easy. Lying is a sin. Stealing is a sin. Murder is a sin. Adultery is a sin. Pornography is a sin. Sex before marriage is a sin. Living with a boyfriend or a girlfriend is a sin. Sex outside of marriage is a sin. Okay, what is marriage? Pastor Chris, I know homosexuals, they're monogamous, they're faithful in their marriage, they're not committing adultery, they're same sex. What did God say? Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2. God made the male and female. And the male will leave his mother and father and become one. And then Jesus, Matthew chapter 19. Marriage is the man and the woman. One man, one woman becoming one. Jesus affirmed it. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It's all there. It's very clear. Same-sex marriage is not marriage. It's sin. But there are pastors that are calling themselves ministers, preachers of the gospel, who are openly affirming it and living it. This is not good news, friends. These are wolves. Ah, oh, but Chris, aren't, here, here's what the, everybody will say. Really? You re, the, 2017, 2017, you want to be on the wrong side of history? Have you heard that one? Just like in, you know, United States, 1960s, those who opposed the rights and liberties of African Americans, racists, bigots, 
they were on the wrong side of history. Just like Nazis in World War II are on the wrong side of history. You, Christian people, churches, pastors who are against homosexuality, you want to be on the wrong side of history? Don't you understand? We as human beings are evolved as social people in our thinking, in our knowledge, in our understanding. Don't you understand that you doing this are taking, you're taking the church back? The Bible is very clear. No. Sexual immorality, homosexuality, that's, that's been in history. It goes all the way back. You could even look at Noah. And you could even see it's happening there. There's always been homosexuality. There's always been sexual immorality. There's always been, quote unquote, open, free sexuality from the beginning of humanity. That's one of the problems. It's not the wrong side of history. That's history. It's nothing new under the sun. So we have to close. Chris, well, where's the good news? Where's the gospel? It was back where we read in verse 1. They deny the sovereign Lord who bought them. Jesus paid it all. How did he pay it? It's hanging up there behind me on the wall. You see, um, and, and Peter talked about it, there's, there's, there's a kind of freedom that the, the people out there are talking about. And they, they flip the idea of freedom. Here's what they're saying. Oh, church, oh, religion, oh, Christianity. It's hampering me. It's caging me in. I need to be free to express my sexuality. And not only that, Chris, don't you know anything about, you know, gender fluidity? I'm not comfortable in my body. I was born in a man's body, but I am a, a woman inside. I don't agree with my body parts. I get that. Gender dysmorphia, it happens. Don't you understand, Chris, Se sexual. I'm not attracted to, to women. I'm a man and I'm attracted in my being. It's who I am as a human. For you to not allow me to express my sexuality is to die, deny me my humanity. If that's the case, I mean, adultery. How many men in here, married? You think adultery is just committing the act physically? No, Jesus said, committing the act in your mind and in your heart by intention. You already, how many in here are already adulterers? I'll be the first to raise my hand. Oh, but if I'm allowed to express my adultery, I will be free? It's not freedom. That's slavery. That's what Peter is saying. So the world is saying, Chris, you're not free. The ones who are allowing their passions and their lust and their desires to define them and to live out that, they're free. Peter is saying, no, they flipped it. They have flipped it. You're not free. You're a slave. You're a slave. It's what you're mastered by. And so here's what the gospel is. I am free to choose to no longer be controlled by my body, by my desire. I am now free to be controlled by the power of God. My identity, who I am, is no longer in who I want to have sex with. You know, the Alcoholics Anonymous, the AA, interesting, they have this thing where the first thing they do in the meetings is they introduce themselves 
hello, my name is da 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 da, and I am an alcoholic. That's not what Christians do. I don't define myself, my identity, in my addiction, in my sin, in my habits, in my, in my weakness. I identify myself in Christ Jesus. Amen. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. My life is hidden with Christ in the heavenlies. I am a son of God, a co-heir with Christ. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm an adulterer. I'm a pornographer. I'm a liar. I'm a, no. My life is hidden in Christ. I am free. And so we go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. No, excuse me, verse 2. No, excuse me, verse, verse 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Yes. And we have what? We have in verse 6, self-control self-control and here's what they're saying you want me to suppress my sexuality therefore you make me less human no 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 you're flipping it around again don't do that because in chapter 1 Peter says we can participate in the divine nature we're going to elevate our humanity by submitting ourselves to the divine power. In fact, in chapter 2, I, we skipped it, but it, it, Peter hints at it. Chapter 2, verse 4, okay? Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, day after day. Uh, go down, verse 11. Okay. Oh, ah, here we are, verse 12. People blaspheme in manners they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct. What is Peter saying? What is the Bible saying? Here's what he's saying. I submit myself to my sexual desires. I identify myself by my sexual orientation, my gender fluidity. I am actually becoming less human. Do you understand? I'm, I'm living according to my instincts. I'm identifying myself to my bodily urges. That's not human. You're not human. You're, you're, you're degrading yourself to becoming an animal. And God had something greater for you. And interestingly enough, Peter, when he talked about Balaam, Balaam and the talking donkey, the animal had more sense than the human. The human who wanted to give in or use sexuality. Right? And so he's saying this, the gospel is this, you have humanity that's waiting for you. Your humanity is waiting to be fulfilled. God has something so much greater for you. And the way that he accomplished your humanity, your evolution, your dignity, your restoration, your freedom is through the cross that was bought by the blood. You were bought, verse 1. You were bought. You have to go back to that. And the more you go back to Jesus, the more you put Jesus higher, and the more you focus on Jesus, the more you're able to get away from the lust, the corruption, the muck, and the mire. That's the word he has there, the, the corruption. That's what we read. The corruption is miasma. It's just this filth. You're trying to escape it. You know it. But you can't. You just don't know how. It's got its claws on you. And, it's, and the gospel is, no, you can escape through the divine power given to you by Jesus Christ who bought you by his blood. Let's finish with this. 
they say, I can have freedom to do whatever I want with my body. Jesus says, I laid my body down for you so you could be free from your passions. Jesus, the day before, the night before he was crucified, was struggling with his desires. His desire was not to go to the cross. Everything in him wanted to not die for us. And he said, Father, if, I can't, if it's possible, let this pass from me. He was sweating blood. So much was his distress. And he said, no, nah, Father, not my will, but yours. Listen to me now. Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher. If Jesus is who he said that he is, then he is my master, he is my Lord, and I am free to follow him. I have all the power, all the energy, all the strength. And all these false teachers out there asking for my money, trying to get in my pants, they're like, they're like empty wells. That's what we read. They promise power. They promise health. They promise happiness. They promise satisfaction. Nothing. Nothing. But Jesus promises. And when Jesus promises, He can deliver. What's your issue? Is it therapy? Are we trying to, to be, you know, what are we doing? We're trying to be, okay, we have faith, and faith will help us become stronger, and yay. Is, it, is that what this is? Let's all hug each other and feel nice? Or let's submit to, to our Lord and Master. There's a lot of love, and love will overcome. But it's not a free, easy, cheap love. It's a holy love. Holy love. Jesus loves us with a holy love. And that demands holiness. But that demand is met by His power. So my, my, my beloved, my friends, my, my brothers, my sisters, be careful what you post on Facebook. <laughs> and be careful. Who you, look, I, I was praying for you. I know. You, you got, you're downloading, you're streaming, you're watching all kinds of teachers and pastors and preachers and Bible teachers. I, I know, I do the two. And it's hard to figure out, oh, is he for real? Is there, are they for real? Or are they, are they wolves? Listen, if you don't know, ask me. I'll be happy to look it up for you. And if you want somebody to listen to, you, and you know Pastor Chris will, is okay with them, Ask me. I'll be happy to give you a list of 20 that I listen to that will be legitimate for you. So we go to Pastor Jesus now. We go to Pastor Christ. And we offer ourselves to Him. Would you come with me? Lord Jesus, um, it's not a sermon I wanted to preach, not a sermon I'm trying to preach. But Lord Jesus, you, you took us here today. And so Lord Jesus, help us to understand, help us to submit, help us to obey. Lord Jesus, for those here struggling with sexuality or sexual sin, the past, Lord Jesus, wash us clean. We come to you with nothing of our own to wash ourselves with. We come only with our faith and our humility. And you promised us, like Cindy said, he who seeks will find. He who asks will receive. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for opening the door to us. We thank you for washing us 
and cleansing us and turning us around. We thank you for conviction of sin, repentance of sin, and regeneration. We thank you, Lord, for the new birth and the new identity. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that I am not a pornographer. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a sexual deviant. I'm not a, a prostitutor, but I am in you, Lord Jesus Christ, and I will receive your identity, and I thank you for that, Lord. Father, I pray for those here struggling with holiness. Help them, O oh God. Give them your Holy Spirit. Give them power to participate in the divine nature, to put away the corruption of the flesh and of the lustful desires, to put to death the misdeeds of the body and to live according to your spirit. For this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.